Welcome to this week's AFPI Rundown. This week, we look back at the 23rd anniversary of the 9-11 terror attacks and highlight key insights from AFPI's policy experts as they appeared across the media landscape to discuss national security, border control, and economic recovery. Let's take a closer look at these critical issues. Appearing on Fox News, AFPI's Chair for the Center for Homeland Security and Immigration, Chad Wolf, discusses ongoing national security threats, emphasizing the vulnerability at the southern border and how lessons from 9-11 are being ignored. Chad highlighted the ongoing risk from the Biden administration's open border policy, explaining the need for stronger border security. All right, Sandra, let's bring in Chad Wolf, former acting DHS secretary and executive director of the America First Policy Institute. When you listen to some of that gun wrenching testimony on Capitol Hill today, uh, Emily Campagna said it very well. She said, where's the prosecutor? Where's the tough on crime borders are in all of this? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Look, when I hear that type of testimony, I, I hear a lot of passion, but I hear someone, whether it's the family or, or individuals, advocates that are looking for solutions. They, they're tired of what they've seen over the last three and a half to four years of these policies that are making communities less and less safe and more and more victims are occurring. Mm -hmm. And so they, they want solutions and they get very frustrated. And, and the clip you showed, very frustrated that the left continues to dismiss those concerns, the grief that they're that and and just say they're being used by by some. That's simply not the case. They, they're simply trying to deal with what's in front of them, what's facing their communities, and they want solutions. And they're not hearing any uh, from the folks that are in charge today. You know, I don't know how much the debate moderators tonight are going to drill down on the border, but if they do to a significant degree, that's going to put Kamala Harris in a difficult position. It's an impossible position. Uh, she has the worst track record imaginable along that border. As, as someone that was put in charge of the border, whether you want to call her the borders are or not, uh, her track record and the fact that that border has seen a, an explosive increase of millions of individuals from all over the world come to that border and be released into American communities and the victims that we see every single day, the national security threats coming across that border, the number of known and suspected mm -hmm. terrorist criminals her track record is abysmal, and there's no way that she can defend that. So what she will likely do is simply point to President Trump and say, I don't like his policies. I don't like what he did. Uh, but don't look at my record because I, it, it's indefensible. Yeah. Well, here's something else that she's going to have to defend against. This is a new incident happened on Martha's Vineyard, an illegal immigrant charged with child rape. Oh, and here's the other part. Months after being freed from prison. The New York Post wrote it this way. He popped back up on ICE's radar in February of last year after he was arrested by local cops in Martha's Vineyard on a slew of charges, including strangulation, assault and battery on a family or a household member, and threat to commit a crime. Just months later, he was rearrested and indicted in Duke's County Superior Court on the rape charges, federal officials said. Here's a guy who was arrested, freed from prison, and then rapes a young girl. How do you how do you how do you explain that, let alone defend against it? Uh, th there is no explanation. Obviously, he should have been turned over to ICE uh, removal officers when he was in jail and they figured out he was an illegal alien. My, my guess is there was uh, if there was a detainer lodged, uh, the detainer was not recognized by local mm -hmm. law enforcement there. And then he was released to offend again and again and again. And this is what we see every day from these juris these uh, sanctuary jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to, you know, uh, Vice President Harris has advocated in the past, right? She wanted to cut ICE funding. She wanted to cut or eliminate ICE detainers. And she wanted to eliminate ICE detention. If you do any of those three, or if you do all of those three, that border is so wide open. There is no enforcement. Today, it, it gets much worse than what we see mm -hmm. today. But yet, that is what she has advocated for. Yeah, she also advocated for, according to that ACLU questionnaire back in 2019, taxpayer-funded gender transition surgeries for detained migrants. 
Uh, she's got a new issues page up on her website, much of which is cut and pasted from the old uh, Joe Biden website. Here's what she says uh, about her policies on immigration. She says, Harris knows that our immigration system is broken and needs comprehensive reform that includes stronger border security and an earned pathway to citizenship. J.D. Vance responded to that this way on X, saying, quote, if there's a takeaway from this section, it's that Kamala opened our borders to 8.5 plus million illegal aliens, lied about it for almost four years, blamed others when she got caught and now wants to reward those illegals with citizenship. Last thought. Yeah, absolutely. This pathway to citizenship that they continue to talk about, is just going to incentivize more and more illegal aliens coming to that southern border. It is no solution to the border crisis. The two are completely separate. And I have no one can define or tell me how providing amnesty or a pathway actually solves the crisis. What it will do is it will drive more individuals wanting that same mm -hmm. amnesty, wanting that same pathway. And you'll see this border crisis explode even more. All right. Well, we'll see what comes of it at the debate tonight, uh, 9 o'clock this evening, just about seven hours from now. Chad, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Also appearing on Fox News this week, General Keith Kellogg, AFPI's co-chair for the Center for American Security, reflected on his experience during the 9-11 attacks and warns of future security risks due to lax immigration and border policies. General Kellogg discusses the vulnerability of the U.S. due to the open border, connecting it with the ongoing threat of terrorism. Let's bring in Lieutenant General Keith Kellogg, former Trump National Security Advisor. You know, General, when you consider the hell that 19 people who made it into this country did, what's the potential for the future mm -hmm. with so many millions of people coming into this country in the last few years, many of whom have not been properly vetted, as we discover? after they commit crimes. Yeah, yeah, John, and you're absolutely right. Look, the, the lights are blinking red. The potential for something like this happening again is there. You know, I was in the Pentagon when on 9-11 23 years ago in the National Military Command Center, and I watched 93 go down. We, need, we watched the symbol, symbology of it when it went down. And what people don't realize at the time is that right before that, Vice President Cheney had said, through this, our, our speaker box, you got word from the president that we were weapons free over Washington D.C. Now most Americans don't know what that means. Well, when we were told we were weapons free over not, over Washington D.C., that meant we had the authority to shoot down anything that was flying to include commercial airliners, and that would have meant potentially Flight 93. I think what those Americans on board that aircraft did was so heroic. But boy, we need to be very very concerned about what's happening now with our southern border, with those people coming across, how many are coming across that are illegal, we don't know, undocumented, coming from uh, uh, unprotected states. You know, we talked earlier about the special interest aliens coming in from un countries like Tajikistan. That number last year was over 74,000. So I think the potential is out there, and we have to be very, very aware of it. You know, and just you just imagine just a few number of terrorists, what that did to our nation and the things we had to go through subsequent to that. So, yeah, I think it's a big concern and we should need to be concerned about it. And I think the potential of that happening again is very, very real. Our adversaries see it. They know there's a porous border in the south. They know they can push through what I would call advanced parties that come through and put them into sleeper cells. It's been done before. That's not unknown. It's not unusual. And I think we have to be ready for it. General, it's Sandra here as we continue to look at these live pictures. Former President Donald Trump on the ground there in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Um, the family member of a victim who joined us last hour, um, Brett Eagleson, he is part of more than 3,000 family members of 9-11 victims who are, um, as they say, making noise, standing up and demanding that both former President Donald Trump and Vice President Harris oppose any Middle East peace deal with Saudi Arabia unless the kingdom acknowledges and is held accountable for its involvement in the attack. I just want to get your thoughts on that, General. Yeah, Sandra, you know, I obviously is a, what we would call a political issue. But look, he also made a very clear distinction about the, the Saudi Arabia country that we know it as of today and all the reform measures, measures that have been taken by MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, who's the crown prince who's going to follow the king when he passes away. But I think everybody has to acknowledge what actually happened 23 years ago and where those people were trained and where they came from. And I think it's appropriate. Of course, it's, we should recognize that. We should recognize who the bad people were, how it, how it happened, how they got here, and, and everything that was subsequent to it. And I think that I'm a big believer, Sandra, in accountability 
and responsibility. And I think that's a fair comment he needs to make. Let's bring closure to him. It's not today. It's what happened yesterday. At least acknowledge that. Yeah. So in terms of Flight 93 and where it was going, uh, it's believed that it was probably destined mm -hmm. for the Capitol building. And we heard earlier today on the uh, visual timeline that ran on Fox and Fox and Friends, we heard the moments that the terrorists broke into the cockpit and the, uh, the pilots were uh, mm -hmm. wrestling with them to try to get them out. Uh, they barricaded themselves in the cockpit. It was uh, Todd Beamer and a, and a group of other passengers who decided they were going to rush the cockpit and, uh, and try to take back control of the plane. It was believed, I've heard, at that point that they thought that maybe they could get back control of the plane and perhaps have air traffic controllers talk them through some, hopefully, what would have been a safe landing. But as we know, the plane went down. But it also should be pointed out, General, that fighter jets at that point had picked up on Flight 93 and were prepared to take it out of the sky if it looked like it was going to threaten Washington. Yeah, John, that's what I meant about the comment being weapons free. We mm -hmm. were told we were allowed the military to shoot down or knock down anything that was coming. Here's what's amazing is the aircraft that initially lifted off out of Andrews Air Force Base did not have any weapons on them. And the two pilots that lifted with their F-16s were going to ram an aircraft that was coming in. We had alerted the first fighter wing down at Langley Air Force Base, and we did the time distance factor. And candidly, we would have not been able to pick up 93 coming in. And remember, I was in the NMCC, the National mm -hmm. Military Command Center. We would not have been able to pick them up. The arm jets wouldn't have been able to, to intercept it. And we do know subsequently to it, that it was, in fact, the capital they were heading to. And the reason was the documents we picked up finally uh, that we got out of Afghanistan said they were going to the White House. Well, everybody assumed it was the White House. But the pictures we got and the diagrams we got were not the White House. It was the White Capitol building. So that was the target that we know subsequently that they were, in fact, through intelligence, they were, in fact, heading to. And, and God bless those Americans on board that aircraft that went down in, in Shanksville. Because if that aircraft had gotten through, the capital probably would have been gone. Another thing that happened with 93, remember that aircraft was a delayed takeoff. If it had taken off the same time the others had taken off, the capital probably would have been gone. Because we would not have had the alert. They wouldn't have had the alert on the aircraft as well. And we would have been able to alert our fighters being able to intercept. So it was one of those days and actually watching what was happening and actually seeing it going on was absolutely amazing. And by the way, I've got to make an aside. It's an interesting story because the Russians at the very same time this was going on had a major nuclear mm -hmm. exercise going on. And I remember Secretary Rumsfeld picked up the phone on the hotline and called the Russians and said, we're, a, we're a, uh, leveling up our defense condition, taking it up one notch. And within minutes you saw all the Russian systems starting to come down because we do have an ability to watch a lot of things would happen overseas. And they were sending us a very clear message at the time. We don't know who it is either, but it's not us. And so we were able to really focus in on what was happening. But the other one story on that was there were other aircraft coming in at that time squawking hijack. So we didn't know what we were really facing at the time. And back in those days, if you squawked hijack, it was kind of hard to unsquawk. So we were trying to figure out what was coming in and what was happening. But I will tell you, sitting in the National Military Command Center that morning, it was absolutely fascinating. I was really proud of everybody that was going on. Remember, the, second, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, Hugh Shelton, was halfway across the Atlantic heading to England. So Dick Myers was there, and mm -hmm. I was there, uh, the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Scott Gray, was there, and, and then Secretary Rumsfeld. And eventually we went up to Side R and set up an alternate command post. That's why we had to send the president to... to uh, to off, mm -hmm. to off it because for nuclear connectivity because we were concerned the building was going to be lost the Pentagon with all the fires raging on the roof and our satellite communications was going to go down. So it was interesting to watch it, but the focus at that time was on 93 because it had turned. We'd watched it make the turn. We knew it was coming back towards us. The question was, what do we do with it? And then it went down. Chad Wolf also appeared on Fox News to discuss the Biden administration's immigration policies focusing on the influx of Venezuelans and how the lack of vetting creates security risk. Chad explains how 615,000 Venezuelans have entered the U.S. under the current administration's policies, stressing the need for stronger immigration controls. Chad Wolf, Chad, always great to see you. This violence brought upon the United States of America because of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris's open border. How will it be yeah. stopped? 
Well, it's going to be stopped when you have a new chief executive in there that wants to actually secure the border and wants to protect American communities. Look, over the last two years, you've had over 615,000 Venezuelans come across that border or have entered into the United States, and over 100,000 have actually been flown in from, Nicaragua, uh, from Venezuela by the Biden administration. They didn't even have to cross that southern border on the land. They were simply flown in and given parole under this administration. These are all policy choices that the Biden-Harris team has made over the last several years that have put communities at risk. And they see the same reporting that, that you have and the same numbers that you do. And yet, month after month after month, they don't end that program from uh, Venezuela. And in fact, they continue it month after month after month. And so in August and in September and October, you'll continue to see upwards to 10 to 20 uh, thousand Venezuelans come come into the country. So, Chad, uh, again, if, if you want to open up the border, okay, they're open up the border. Uh, listen, I'm opposed to it. But the problem is, yeah. uh, when people come into the country, one of two things happen: either the administration vets the uh, the, the migrant and they know they have the gang members and criminals and, and they let them into the country, or they don't vet anybody and just let everybody into the country. No matter what one is happening, vetting or no vetting, the consequence is the same and they're equally bad. What is happening? Again, if you want to open up the border, how are you getting all these criminals in? Are they not vetting or are they vetting and letting the bad dudes in? Well, I, look, the vetting uh, regime is uh, hit or miss, right? In the sense of the only way to vet an individual from Venezuela is what they're doing now, right? So they're checking U.S. holdings. U.S. databases to say, has this individual come into the United States and does they have, do they have a record? And if they don't, that's all they're checking because Venezuela does not share information with the United States. So if they are a dangerous individual in Venezuela, U.S. law enforcement, has, Border Patrol specifically, almost has no information to do that check against. All they know is they're not wanted, they're not a criminal here in the United States. But if they've never entered the United States or they're coming here for the first time, they're not going to have that record. And so it's very difficult. That's why you don't continue this dangerous policy of just catching individuals and releasing them that we've seen the Biden-Harris team do for three and a half years now. You have to deter that behavior, and then you start seeing a different change uh, in that behavior, and you start seeing less individuals coming, less dangerous individuals coming. That's the only way to stop this is to bring some deterrence back to the system. Right, and uh, somebody like Jared Polis, the governor of Colorado, literally denying and uh, gaslighting people who call attention yeah. to the gang Trend de Aragua that is uh, taking over apartment complexes in Aurora, Colorado. Moving on to this, looks like San Francisco is finally waking up. The sanctuary city is said to be deporting migrants with ties to drug bust. But far too many people have had to suffer for them to take action. Fentanyl killing more than 650 people in the city in just the past year. But if Kamala Harris has it her way, the dealers killing those people would be on the three strike system, only charging at them after their third arrest. Should we be hopeful that San Francisco is finally uh, getting a, a soul and um, a gut? in terms of dealing with these individuals, Chad? Well, it's certainly nice uh, to be hopeful. I'm not, I'm not sure that we can be at this point. We'll have to see what, else, what other measures that they, they take there. But look, this goes to the point of every sanctuary city and every sanctuary jurisdiction around the country, and San Francisco surely is not alone there, which is, I think they're all getting tired of what they see in their communities. They're tired of over three and a half years, almost four years now, of massive amounts of illegal aliens coming into their community and basically being shielded from law enforcement and, and taking a number of criminal acts. And they're saying, look, I'm tired of it. I'm glad they're, they're now saying it. Unfortunately, they shouldn't have put their communities through that for over three and a half years or more, however long they've been that sanctuary uh, jurisdiction. The, the only thing that, that provides sanctuary inside these jurisdictions is you're providing sanctuary from federal law enforcement and you're putting others at risk and I am hopeful that San Francisco and other jurisdictions start to see that and start to see that there's actually benefits to making sure that you have criminals, illegal aliens that are committing criminal acts. Let's turn them over to federal law enforcement yes. and let's remove yep. them. All right, Chad. Well, thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate yep. it. Yep. Notice to uh, Jared Polis in Colorado who signed a sanctuary state law in 2019. Shameful.
Following up on statements presented during the presidential debate on Tuesday, General Kellogg was asked about the facts surrounding the chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan, comparing it to the Trump administration's conditions-based strategy. General Kellogg emphasized the consequences of the failed withdrawal and how it weakened U.S. credibility globally. Here's what he had to say. Is Trump to blame in any way for the Afghan debacle, as Harris implies? Hey, Stuart, thanks for having me. The answer is no. Look, I was part of the, the negotiations and agreements that we had with the Doha Agreement. And when President Trump picked up the phone and called Muddle Berarder, who was the number one Taliban leader, and actually started talking to him, and with the Ghani government, and we had a conditions-based agreement. That's called the Doha Agreement. By the way, you can actually pull that up online and look at it. And until those agreements had been made, there was going to be no withdrawal. We were going to go down to around 3,000 soldiers. We were going to go down to around 3,000 what we call paramilitary. Even former Secretary of State Pompeo has said it was conditions-based. And when we got there, everybody had to agree where we were going to go to in the future. The Ghani government and the Taliban as well. So we had it pretty well under control. And for her to say something like that is absolutely absurd. Frankly, Stuart, and to be very blunt, it's a lie to the American people, and the American people can cross-check that. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, why didn't she say at least one thing yesterday when she made that comment, and I'm, I'm sorry that we lost 13 great yeah, Americans never mentioned that it. day at Abbey Gate. She never mentioned it, not, not once, and she never has, I don't believe. No. Uh, a different subject, uh, General. Uh, listen to Trump speak about Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Roll it. That war should have never started. She was the emissary. They sent her in to negotiate with Zelensky and Putin, and she did. And the war started three days later. And that's the kind of talent we have with her. She's worse than Biden. In my opinion, I think he's the worst president in the history of our country. She goes down as the worst vice president in the history of our country. But let me tell you something. She is a horrible negotiator. Uh, General, is Trump right on that? Sure is. Look, she went to Munich in February 2022, what's called the Munich Security Agreement. It's just, I'm sorry, the, the, the uh, consortium there in Munich. And she met with Zelensky. And she told Zelensky, this was days before the invasion, what he needed to do. And Zelensky told her what the United States needed to do. And the United States did nothing. So she, she went there, sent a message. The message was badly received. She is not a good negotiator. She clearly didn't tell Zelensky what he needed to hear. She really didn't help him out. So, look, this whole administration, they're responsible for things like that. Under the Trump administration, we never started a war. We never saw a war started. We didn't see Putin grab any land. Under Obama, uh, uh, Russia took Crimea. And in February 2022, Russia invaded the rest of Ukraine. That's on their watch. At least take responsibility for it. And, and understand they were part of the problem, part of the issue, and they need to be part of the solution. And honestly, Stuart, they are not part of the solution. Their solution is let the war keep running. The president last night was very clear. This is what we want to do. We want to end the killing. A good negotiator will never tell you what the end state looks like. He will never pick a side. You can go back to Teddy Roosevelt when he negotiated the Treaty of Portsmouth, or you go to Henry Kissinger when he did the Paris Peace Accords. You never tell either side where you intend to go. You bring them together. That what Trump needs to do. He can do it. I know he can do it. And they don't seem to understand that. So do I trust her to negotiate anything with Putin? No. Final comment. Remember, Biden has not called Putin in over two years. If you want to talk to an adversary, you need to at least pick up the phone and call him, at least get him to the negotiation table. They can't do it. They won't do it. They have no respect for uh, either uh, Harris or Biden. All right, General Kellogg, thanks for joining us, General. Turning to economic policies, Michael Falkender, AFPI's chief economist, contrasts the economic prosperity under the Trump administration with the failures of Bidenomics, particularly focusing on inflation and job loss. Mike outlined how Trump's policies led to economic growth, while the Biden administration's overregulation has stifled progress. Joining me now, the one and only Michael Falkender. Michael, thanks for being with us. Always have fun. Uh, when you come on, I'm, we're in Philadelphia. I'm kind of fired up about this debate tonight because I really got a feeling it's going to go well. I don't tra think Trump's going to get baited. But you look at these cross tabs. I mean, 60% of likely voters see President Trump as the change candidate. Only 40% see Harris's change. Get this. 
58% say that he's the moderate in the race. He's the moderate. 60% well, he say is. she's the liberal and too far left wing. What, break all this down for us, Mike. Yeah, let me add a number, another number in there for you, John, which is that according to the most recent Gallup survey, 76% of the American people consider the economy fair or poor, and only 24% think that it's good or excellent. And Kamala Harris is the incumbent in this race. As you just said, the American people understand that the status quo is Kamala Harris, the change agent is Donald Trump. And what would that be a change to? You know, Kamala Harris says it's, it's a change to go backwards. No. If you want an aspirational, optimistic approach towards the future, it means unleashing the American people. If you want to take advantage of all of these new technologies that are coming online, if we want to once again lead the world in energy independence, in technological innovation, then we need to once again provide a government that scales back, that gets out of people's way, that lets people run their own lives, that lets companies compete with the best of the rest of the world, because we know that when we unleash the American economy, we can do better than everywhere else in the world. And what we've had under the Biden-Harris administration is big government coming in and telling everybody what they can, what kind of car they can buy, what kind of stove they have to use, what kind of energy they're allowed to have, where they live, and it's just, it's, this is the most stark difference between two candidates in my adult lifetime, John. And so I cannot wait for tonight because Donald Trump is going to make Kamala Harris own the failure of the last four years. This is Kamalanomics at this point. This isn't, this isn't about Biden anymore. She was the tie-breaking vote on the American Rescue Plan that gave us the inflation. She is the tie-breaking vote on what they call the Inflation Reduction Act or what I call the Make China Great Act that is imposing this green scam on the American people. She was the last one in the room on Afghanistan. She was the last one in the room when they decided to unleash all of those illegal immigrants as the borders are. So he is going to make her own this record. Every single problem we're confronting in the United, in the United States today is as a result of the bad policies where Kamala Harris was the incremental person. And that's why if you want optimism, if you want change, if you want to make your life better, if you actually want to bring the American people together, there is nobody else in this race other than Donald Trump that's going to do it. Michael, what does President Trump have to do on that debate stage tonight for 90 minutes? He needs to remind the American people of the affordability and the optimism that we had under his watch. The American people know what kind of great economy we had when we had America First economic policies in place. We had low inflation, we had low energy prices, we had abundant food and housing was affordable, we had low interest rates, jobs were abundant, we had low poverty rates. Remember, President Trump set records for poverty rates. He set record, he, you know, 50 year low in the unemployment rate, all with low inflation. We can once again get back to an outcome where the average household saw a $4,000 increase in purchasing power in a single year, $6,000 over the course of the Trump presidency, as opposed to losing thousands of dollars under the Biden Harris administration. So if you want to have more control of your life, President Trump is going to remind the American people of what we had prior to the, the pandemic being caused by that virus spread from China, that he had a fantastic, best in the world economy in place. You know, John, I remember sitting in the Treasury building under, under the Trump administration, having foreign leaders come in and say to Secretary Mnuchin that he was the envy of the world because of the economy that we had in 2019. We can get that again if we put in place the right leader with the right policies. And so President Trump striking an optimistic, pro-growth, low inflation, empowerment of the American people tone tonight and reminding people that Kamala Harris is just tripling down on the failure of the Biden-Harris administration. And the contrast could not again be more stark. And I think he is not going to, he's not going to fall for their traps. He is not gonna get baited by them. He is going to return to a very simple contrast. Do you want more of the same that 76% of you think is only fair or poor? Or do we want to go back to the America First policies that gave us, that gave us affordability and abundance? What do you th how do you think he's going to handle tonight when uh, the conversation goes to the border? And she says, well, look, you know, we had the strongest border policy. You know, we had conservatives in the Senate wanted it. And you basically told everybody to vote no. How should he handle that? 
Well, I think what he wants to do is remind people of all of the wall materials that are still sitting down on the border that the Biden-Harris administration is selling for pennies on the dollar rather than putting it in place. Remind the American people of the 100,000 fentanyl deaths that are coming from this invasion of Chinese fentanyl coming over our border and that the border czar has done nothing to curb all of those deaths. Right. This is a 9-11 type event. Right. Tomorrow is 9-11. We have a 9-11 number of deaths every 10 days from fentanyl because of the failed border policies of this administration. It's not about xenophobia. It's not about being somehow racist against people coming into this country. It's about protecting our children. It's about protecting the wages of the American people. It's about protecting our cities from the crime that is coming. And it's about protecting our sovereignty and saying that we the American people can set our own destiny and not have this foreign invasion of the drugs and crime that are coming from across the border. And at the end of the day, Kamala Harris was the border czar. The, the left wing media may want to rewrite that all they want. The Biden Harris administration may want to walk away from from her being the border czar. But how many examples do we have uh, in the press and, and Joe Biden himself announcing that she was taking the lead on addressing the border situation, and we have had the worst border failing in the history of our country. And I think it's important that Donald Trump address that very chart that saved his life, that talks about the, all the different ways that illegal immigrants are coming into this country. They can manipulate statistics to say, oh, we've curbed the invasion. But I'm sorry, John, when you have foreigners, foreign illegals, sign up on an app and then get on a flight into our country to claim asylum, that still counts as an illegal immigrant coming into this country. They don't want to count it because they want to manipulate the statistics and the ABC moderators are probably going to let them get away with it. But it's so important that President Trump draw back on that, again, that graph he was showing in that Butler, Pennsylvania field that talks about all the different ways that we're being invaded and I think that, that he's got that thing charred in his memory because it was so pivotal in saving his life. But that is an incredibly important set of numbers for the American people to understand about the border. Michael Falkender, great analysis. AFPI's Mike Berry joined Real America's Voice and made a strong argument advocating for proof of citizenship for voting, explaining how it safeguards election integrity and prevents fraud. Mike explained the importance of ensuring that only American citizens are allowed to vote and how this strengthens democracy. Here to break down what all of this means is Michael Berry. He is the legal extraordinaire and executive director of America First Policy Institute Center for Litigation. Michael, thanks for joining us, brother. Uh, real quick, why wouldn't a state like Wisconsin be able to remove RFK Jr. from ballots? and? Is any is anyone doing anything to address this? Well, there's no reason why a state shouldn't be able to remove him. You know, if you recall, it wasn't that long ago that these states were doing everything they could to prevent RFK from getting onto the ballot. And so I think it's ironic that now that he's been able to get on the ballot, and he's, he had to file lawsuits in some of these states just to get on the ballot, and now that he's decided to suspend his his candidacy and his in his campaign, and he's endorsed President Trump, all of a sudden. They're doing everything they can to prevent him from getting off the ballot. This is just going to sow confusion among the voters. Uh, it's obviously an attempt to interfere with the election and, and to just create uh, more confusion and chaos. And so uh, my understanding is that, that RFK's legal team has once again had to go to court and either sue or threaten to sue in order to get him from, removed from the ballot in these key states. And I, I just, you know, it bears reminding that when... President Biden decided that he was no longer going to run for president, whether that was his decision or not. Um, nevertheless, he was removed from the ballot and replaced with Vice President Harris. And it wasn't uh, obviously it wasn't all that difficult for them to remove him and replace him with her. So I don't understand why there should be all this difficulty in removing RFK from the ballot now that he's announced that he's not running for president. Yeah, I mean, obviously, every state is different and major party candidates fare differently given who is or isn't on a ballot. So can you just walk us through why Cornell West and Jill Stein are having issues with ballot access? Yeah, well, like you said, every state has its own rules. Uh, there are deadlines that have to be met. There are 
ballot access requirements, such as a certain minimum threshold number of signatures uh, that have to be, you know, that, that have to be certified and verified. And so every state does things a little bit differently, just like we see with, with early voting. You know, we're starting to see now that some states have different early voting dates than other states. And for a lot of people, that, that, that can be confusing and a little chaotic. But that's the way our system has been for a long time. And the same goes with, with ballot access. But the important thing is, it's to me, it's imperative that the voters are given clear information about who is actually on the ballot, who's actually running for president, and who is not. And this is clearly intended to be an effort by the left to interfere with the two candidates who are actually running for president. And it should be a clear choice to the voters, Donald Trump or Kamala Harris. And when you put when you do things like keep RFK Jr. on the ballot, all you're doing is just creating an opportunity for chaos. The left knows that RFK being on the ballot is going to hurt the Trump campaign more than it's going to hurt the Harris campaign. They know that, and that's what this is all about. It's just another attempt to try to subvert the system, bend the rules to their own favor, which is what they always do. Michael, shifting gears slightly to another election integrity issue, there's a lot of pressure for House Speaker Johnson to put the SAVE Act in the upcoming House spending measure. Now, why wouldn't he do this? And why is this bill, which simply requires workers to verify citizenship status before allowing someone to vote, such a controversial issue? Yeah, well, let's start there. Why is it so controversial? <laughs> We've heard for months now from the left, they keep saying there's no reason for, you know, there's no reason to require what we call dem uh, demonstrated proof or documented proof of citizenship, DPOC. Uh, there's been a Supreme Court dis case about this now, uh, in, in, about the, the law that Arizona passed to require this. And so uh, this bill that was introduced, I believe, by, by Congressman Chip Roy, uh, and now supported by President Trump, supported by Speaker Johnson, all it requires that in order to, to vote, you have to prove that you are in fact a U.S. citizen, which is what the law requires. We hear the left saying this is unnecessary. The law already prohibits non-citizens from voting. Well, if the law prohibits it, then why not pr provide an enforcement mechanism? Why not provide something that says, yeah, you know, it's just like when we drive on the roads, there's a speed limit on the road that says, you can't drive any faster than this speed. Not requiring proof of citizenship is like saying, we're going to put up speed limit signs, but we're not going to hire any police officers to ensure that people actually obey the law. And that's what this law is really about. Now, whether or not it actually makes it into the CR and, and, and has an opportunity to actually get a vote, an up or down vote in Congress is a completely different story. I think we've already heard from uh, Senator Schumer uh, and, and those in the Senate that even if this somehow makes it through the House, it's going to be dead on arrival in the Senate. So I think that further demonstrates why the American people, if you care about election integrity, if you care about ensuring that only Americans vote in American elections, only American citizens, that is, vote in American elections, then you, you need to be, it's not just about who the president is. Obviously, that's uh, one of, if not the most important elections of our lifetimes. But you also need to be paying attention to what we call the down ballot uh, elections as well. Who ends up being your senator? Who ends up being your governor? Who's your congressman? Because these are issues that are going to affect uh, laws just like the SAVE Act, which should absolutely become a law in this country. Michael Berry, do not go anywhere because we want you back here after the commercial break. To learn more about how AFPI is advancing America First policies, visit us at AmericaFirstPolicy.com. If you have any feedback, be sure to leave a comment below. Please like and share if you enjoyed this video and remember to subscribe to our channel to stay informed on America First policies for our nation. Mm.